Um, I should introduce myself. I am, of course, the uh, Honourable Rachel Beatrice K. Shuttleworth, uh, known to everyone as Miss Rachel. Honourable, honourable, because my father is a baron, Lord Shuttleworth, uh, but Miss Rachel because I'm the third daughter. Uh, but throughout my life, I've just been known as Miss Rachel. Uh, never married, never had the time, too busy. <laughs> Too many interesting things. In fact, if men got a little bit too persistent, I just directed them to my father who put them off entirely. <laughs> Let us give you a little bit of idea about the hall, those of you who know it well, those of you who are fresh to it. The land here at Gawthorpe has been in the Shuttleworth family since at least 1388, uh, where my ancestor, Utrid, wonderful name, uh, rented it. But gradually over the two to three centuries, we made quite a lot of money. We were rather good at it. We acquired land, and on that land we had farms, we had mines, we had other um, products. We married well, always a good idea. And we were also in the justice business. We were in the law. And there are quite a lot of perks in the justice business in fines and fees that can be levied on all sorts of people. And so by the time we get to 1600, when my ancestor Richard Shuttleworth decided that on the land there needed to be a building, a house, a hall worthy of the name, we were doing quite well. We were doing so well, in fact, we lent money to Queen Elizabeth. That's quite well off. And we remained quite well off for quite a long time. So, Sir Richard had this idea that he was going to build the hall at Gawthorpe on this land. Perfect idea, only one downside, he died. So, his brother, Lawrence, took over the project and had the hall built. It took between 1600 and 1605 to build it. Walls and main structure up in a couple of years, by 1605, almost ready to be lived in. Only one downside, Lawrence died. <laughs> so the first two brothers who had put all their heart and soul into it never got to live in Gawthorpe Hall. So it was therefore left to a nephew, another Richard. The names keep coming round, to be honest. If you're not called Richard, you're not a Shuttleworth. So we end up with Colonel Richard Shuttleworth as being the first one to actually inhabit Gawthorpe Hall. And he did so all the way through the English Civil War. Parliamentarian, any royalists here? Good. So, uh, sadly his son was killed at Lancaster, but he had other successes which I can tell you about inside. But let's look at the hall. The elevations were designed by the same architect as Hardwick Hall. You know, Hardwick Hall, more glass than wall, is the, uh, the saying for that building. We're not quite that, but fairly well. But when you look at this hall, and people say, oh, is that original? Oh, is that, the is that original? Well, there are two kinds of original here. There's the original 1600 to 1605 building, but then, in 1850s, it was all remodelled because Colonel Richard Shuttleworth, the Civil War parliamentarian, after he had lived here, when he died in 1669, that was it. The family moved out. All that effort. And for the next 150 years, the family didn't live here at all. It was rented out, it was used for other things, and it wasn't particularly loved. When we get to 1818, we come to a, an infant who inherits the Shuttleworth fortunes. Janet Shuttleworth, single female infant inheritor. She marries, she marries Sir James Kay. And therefore by a special uh, royal charter, we 
emerge the two names of Shuttleworth, who have been here for centuries, and Kay. Only the other way around. Kay Shuttleworth sounds better. And they decide to move back into the house. When she's an adult, they marry, and they remodel it by Sir Charles Barry and Pugin, also better known for dealing with the Houses of Parliament. But many of the designs that you might spot as you go around are also echoed in the Houses of Parliament. So the two families, the Kays and the Shuttleworths, come together and we have both mottos. Up on the very top we have the Shuttleworth motto there, Prudentia et Justitia, Prudence and Justice. Yes, and if you're very prudent, the justice business does you quite well. That central tower was part of the original design, but it was a story shorter. In the 1850s remodeling, it was raised one story. Bit of a mistake to start with. They realized that that was actually causing subsidence and they had to underpin the whole thing. But never mind, we kept going. And similarly, the porch was re-altered. And above that, just above the door, you can see the second motto, the K motto. Words beginning with the letter K. Kind kin knorn keep. Basically means keep the family and friends around you. Those you love, keep them with you. And so the two mottos demonstrate the two families joined together and Gawthorpe Hall in the 1850s came into this fusion, if you like, of Tudor to Stuart and then add the Victorian adaptations. Tower, excellent tower. One of the things that I was uh, very, I've, I've always been very careful about that tower, many's the winter when there's been snow around that I've had to put my clogs on, get onto the tower roof and on the flat roof and just shovel the snow off. At, uh, because I came back to live here in uh, 1952 and since then it's been my care entirely but before that I looked after this house for many many years in fact I first had a house of my own when I was 60 that tower roof I'm afraid I don't suffer fools gladly I'm sure there are no fools here because I was up on that tower roof with a young man who came from the county architect's department. And he was standing up there and he looked at the old lead-lined roof and he said, well, I'm sure we can do better than that. What we need to do to keep this hall perfectly watertight is that we'll take all that back and we'll give it a nice skim of asphalt and that will be guaranteed for 30 years. And I said, young man. <laughs> Go back to your office and learn your job. That lead has been there, tried and tested for 300 years. It will last rather more than your skim of asphalt. So, the house, the hall has been in keeping of our family. And that is how we hope it remains. And how it is able to be open to people such as yourselves who love this kind of building. And my grandfather, Sir James, he opened the gardens uh, every Sunday afternoon to the local people from the 1860s. There was no park in Padium and so they were entitled and allowed to come in here for three or four hours every afternoon. And again we have had tours on and off throughout our, uh, uh, our habitation of the hall. I remember a rather good one in uh, 1908 taking tours round and again in 1949. So you are in as part of a, a great tradition. So let us go and have a look inside. This way, please follow me. Come in and join us, have a look around as you, as you enter. A room, of course, you already know. So here we have the entrance hall. Do come on, make sure we're all in. Always, 
Walk in a line, stop in a huddle. That's what I always say, like a, like a penguin. So here in the entrance hall, this was part of that 1850s remodeling. Before that, it was a series of three storerooms and one above. But Barry thought it needed to be brighter, more impressive as an entrance to the hall. And so this was remodeled with adding the screen, taking some items from previous storerooms and buildings, and he put in this rather lovely fireplace, which is a bit of a speciality of Pugin. Because if you look at it as a fireplace, there is something slightly unusual about it, which is, yeah, where is the chimney? Yes, there is the window. And this was, his, this was his party piece, his party trick. Because the chimney actually goes up to the right-hand side. Uh, a party trick, however, that seems to kind of drop on the floor because it always smoked horribly. Whatever we did, we put big hood on it, as you can see, but no, I'm afraid the fireplace never really worked satisfactorily. But it looks good. And you can see the initials there of my grandparents' children. So my grandparents were Sir James and Janet. Their son was Utrid, their eldest son, my father. And Utrid, of course, is the name that I mentioned right at the very beginning as who rented the land in 18, 1388. So uh, an unusual name, but a family name. So there he is in the center as the eldest boy. And Utrid married Blanche, my mother. She was the daughter of a diplomat. A diplomat who had ridden across the battlefield of Waterloo just after the battle. And the Treaty of Aix is actually in his handwriting. So she was Blanche Parish, and she married Utrid down in London and came up to Gawthorpe to live. And their arrival was something to behold. Now, my father told my mother that she should wear the prettiest silk floral dress that she had. Now, she was a little bit worried about this because it's a long and dirty and smoky train journey, steam train, coming up all the way from London. She did not really want to, to damage or dirty her dress. But when she arrived at the Verney Barrack station, she realised why it was that my father wanted her to look her best. Because for the next two and a half miles from Burnley Barracks Station to here, the roads were lined with people, three or four deep, all the way. And the front of the house was black with people, welcoming them. And these are mill workers and so on who were not paid if they were not at work. So it was a great honour and a thank you to the family that they turned out to welcome my parents after their wedding. So carriage and postillions met them, as did all the local farmers and the farmers from the estate, all with their horses with green cockades uh, on the top. Green because although the family colour is silver for livery, you can't wear silver. So it's green for indoors, buff for outdoors. That's with, with silver buttons for the uh, the suggestion of, of, of our actual family colour. And so they came all down this, the, the, the route here. Yeomanry were lined up on the, uh, on the front lawn and fired a salvo of greeting. And so that was the entrance of my parents to Gawthorpe Hall. And my mother thereafter, she always used to wear the prettiest floral silk dresses, lots of lace rippling down the front. And she taught me to do the same. She said, you must always look your best. Obviously, when I was a young, most of my, my clothes came from Paris, um, but I did. And she said it was a compliment. Even if you're going and reading to people who are bedridden or taking soup or whatever to people who are in need in Padium, then you should look your best. It is a compliment to them to do so. 
I remember uh, during the First World War, my sister and I, we were, had a meeting with Miss Llewellyn Davis. She was one of the heads of the, uh, of the Oxford Colleges. Would you like to sit down? There is a... I'm all right. Here you are. Excellent. Then, uh, anyway, there she was, and she looked at me, and I was wearing a, 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 a rather racy hat that had bits of gold tinsel on and black lace and some rather naughty kind of ostrich feathers. And she had a look at it, and she said to me, Miss Rachel, I trust that you do not go amongst the poor wearing such a hat like that. I mean, she was wearing a massive hat, to be honest, with what looked like a dead ostrich sitting on the top of it. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, I'm afraid that my mother taught me that I should always wear my best as a compliment to whoever I was talking to. <laughs> My sister was really very cross with me afterwards because I revealed to her that, in fact, I had made that myself. I, and I just got some scraps and bits and pieces out of my mother's bits box, and it had cost me about sixpence. But clothes were important to us. Clothes were important, as was that kind of social work. My parents did it. They were very involved in education, as my grandfather had been, Sir James Kay, was knighted because of his involvement in education. And then it came down the generations that we started the poor um, relief schemes, we started homes for mothers and babies, we started a lot of help for the local people. I mean, when I was young, I would go into houses in Padium that were so impoverished, the back walls of some of those houses were made of clay, they were built into the into the, 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 in, into the ground, if you like, and were just dripping with water. And you could go into some of these houses and they had absolutely nothing, no food in the larders. And we would sort this out and we would go and find a grocer who would supply them something and we would sort it out and pay for it later. Let's move on. Let's come and have a look at my drawing room through this way. Please follow me. Uh, drawing room used to be a small dining room when it was first here, Jacobean, most wonderful panelling and wonderful plaster work by the, uh, the Gumby brothers. Also did uh, East Riddlesden Hall over in Yorkshire. And so the different bits mean different things. We're talking about plenty. All the, so the, all the stalks are kind of hand um, moulded. They'll be twisted. Then you've got moulds of things like the uh, leaves, the oak leaves and grapes and so on. And then the bigger things around the frieze, like the animals and so on, they will be wood underneath and then coated with plaster. So all the different types of, um, uh, I'm trying to think, craft work are on, on view here. Oh, one of the most interesting things, and we've had quite a lot of guests here, obviously, over the years. My grandfather, um, he was a little bit of, uh, a celebrity hunter, if I put it that way. Uh, and he was absolutely delighted when he managed to persuade Charlotte Bronte to come and visit. Uh, she had originally refused, but he managed to uh, talk to her father and persuaded him to persuade her to come. And these camel back chairs with a rather fashionable uh, Victorian uh, green uh, have borne the imprint of the behind of Charlotte Bronte. And I, I take a moment to, to enjoy that thought. Uh, so she, yes, she came on uh, two occasions, in fact. Fortunately, my grandfather didn't know what her diaries said of the visits when she uh, noted that it was rather a monologue rather than a dialogue. I sat and Sir James, uh, sorry, I sat and listened and Sir James talked was how she put it, and sadly she referred to him as a great bore. Uh, not only that, she, the, the, the hall she referred to as very cold and drafty, she left us and indeed took cold herself. There is a rumour that that was what killed her, but it was not. Yeah, Gawthorpe Hall has nothing to do with the death of one of our greatest novelists, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, she died uh, complications of childbirth. But what else do we have in here? Oh, yes, some rather lovely Venetian glass chandeliers that my mother brought back uh, from Venice, obviously. Uh, lighting 
as always a bit of a problem in this house. We used, obviously, initially candles, but when the family came back uh, in the 1850s, we're talking about oil, we never went through a gas period. We went straight from oil lamps to electricity. Uh, my father was terrified of fire. It's a wooden house, obviously. And uh, it was entrusted to him, and he wanted to keep it and save it. So he insisted on our oil lamps being run on colza oil, which is a much thicker oil than paraffin that other people used to use. And so the footman, we had one footman who started after breakfast and in the winter, and we'd got about 40 oil lamps around the house, and it took him all day just going round and round them because every hour the wick had to be wound a little further up because the oil, colza oil, didn't, was so thick, it doesn't actually travel very easily up the wick. So as it burned down, you'd have to make sure that the, the wick was turned up. And, and every time he did it, he'd come in and he would turn it up. And our guests would be absolutely horrified and wondering what on earth was happening, because he'd come in very quietly, obviously, and silently, and be doing this behind it. And suddenly they would be regaled with the sound of someone vomiting, because as you wound it up and the oil went up, it just basically sounded like people being sick as you did the winding. And it's, what on earth? But we ended up by realizing that this was not a good idea because even though electricity was you know, available in, in the locality, we still didn't have it and we still used um, we still used these oil lamps. But the young people, that's my nieces and nephews, they didn't realize the dangers of, of, of candles and breezes and curtains and so on. And I went into the dining room one, one day, as you were about, be, be about to do, and uh, realized that they, they were doing some kind of uh, playmaking charades kind of things. And they'd moved the candles off the table and into the alcove where the curtains were just blowing in the wind onto the candles. And we almost had the thing alight. And I said to my father, this is not any good at all. We are going to have to deal with this. We are going to have to go for the electricity. Otherwise, this house is just going to go up in flames. Can't be trusted, the young ones. This table, what we used to do after this, we used it as a withdrawing room after meals. And we would come back here. And this was where I was taught to sew by my mother. And uh, in winter evenings, after you know, we'd have a lamp, just the one in the middle, and we would all sit round. I was a third daughter, and we would sit round and make long red flannel petticoats for the poor of Padium. That is full length, and we'd have two or three tucks in them to make sure that they were nice and warm. So each one required five complete circles of white feather stitch all the way round. Very neat by hand. For every petticoat. Um, and that's how I learned how to sew. I was taught by my mother, who also taught me lace making, uh, which I became absolutely obsessed with, to be honest. And uh, when I went down to my boarding school, uh, I, uh, it was, I wasn't as academic. I thought education should be for the mind, the hand, and the eye. And that was what was required. And just, just the brain alone is not enough. And so I was allowed, I persuaded the, the headmistress that I was allowed to do much more craft work and lace making and so on. And by the time I left, I was teaching the other girls how to do this. And it was the start of, of my collection and my fascination with textiles. You can see some of these things all come together in my, uh, what you see where you look. How can the eye not be engaged in this house as a small child? Wherever you look, there are animals, there are people things of nature, designs, patterns, everywhere, colour. How can you not be involved in the art of creating things? So, let's move and let's have a look at the dining room itself, which, as I say, almost went up in flames, but fortunately did not. Now, please, if you wish to sit down on the bench, you're very welcome. Now, 
are sitting down. Excellent. So the dining room, originally a, a great hall and used uh, for performance as much as for eating. So we have a minstrel's gallery above and there were nice high entrances because you would have a, a trestle stage, if you like, at that end on which the players could come and perform. Indeed, we have accounts from the, uh, the period of uh, Colonel Richard, which uh, talks of, of paying the traveling players uh, for coming and performing for the family. Uh, dancing. I, do you like dancing? Excellent. I love dancing. I was very good at it. Wouldn't realize it now, but when I was young, I was very pretty. A golden hair and blue eyes. And in, uh, in 1902, I came out. I was born in 1886. So I came out to the new king as he was then, obviously just after the death of Queen Victoria. So Edward VII, I was presented at court there. And I loved dancing. I hated the small talk. As I said, I don't suffer fools, and some men are, to be honest. <laughs> and the small talk and the just general chit chat was not something that I really enjoyed, but I would forgive any of them anything if they danced well. Can you imagine what we used to do here? On the dining room carpet, we would hire a, a drugget, which was kind of put in place by these rather giant uh, dry drawing pins is what they looked like, to be honest, and really shiny and smooth. It was as good as a proper wooden dance floor, beautiful to dance on. And we also had dances uh, outside in some of the outbuildings. In the summer, my brothers used to play cricket with the local uh, estate workers and so on. Uh, our, our local carpenter was exceedingly good at cricket. He was the only one who had anything kind of approaching whites. Um, but they would wear their working clothes and you'd go over the river. The football pitch was kind of closer to the house and the cricket ground was closer towards Padium. And they would play then and after the match, they'd all come back to the outbuildings and would give them a big tea. And then all the maids and so on would come out and they would have a dance. And we always dressed for dinner, obviously, uh, every evening. So we would be in, uh, in full, uh, full evening dress. But we would put shawls on because... Uh, some of the locals were not used to kind of the décolletage that you would have with evening dress. So we'd put a shawl on to be uh, modest and we would go down and, uh, and watch the, 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 the dancing after the cricket matches. Great fun, great fun. We are now going to have a look downstairs, down into the kitchen, which uh, is not normally opened to, uh, to, to people coming around. So follow me and if... Excellent. So here we have kitchen, obviously, and other um, kind of storage rooms and so on. And the, the odd man, he had a room just on the left. He, he, the odd man was, was, was knives and lamps. He used to come in. So we had a cook housekeeper, uh, two scullery maids, sorry, one scullery maid, two kitchen maids, two housemaids. Uh, there were two ladies maids, one for my mother, and we girls shared one as well. So uh, butler, two footmen, uh, and uh, a man who came in, and the odd man. Excellent. So just listing some of the servants that we had here. Uh, when they were sleeping here down here at night, the butler slept with the silver. The male servants all slept on this level. Uh, the footmen had kind of fold out beds, rather like my brothers had at Eton, actually. Uh, but as soon as they got up, they were just folded up, unmade, um, f unfolded when they uh, needed to go back to bed. I'm not sure if they ever were made, but uh, anyway. Uh, so they all slept down here, and the female servants slept right at the very top of the house, in the top room of the tower that you saw from outside. So we separated them as much as we possibly could. And that was a traditional. Uh, the servants, there's a sad lack of bathrooms in this house. In fact, a sad lack of bedrooms in this house. Uh, but uh, we were people, although we didn't pay huge wages here, it was a good house to, to, to work in. And we did allow them to have, uh, use our baths as long as the family and guests didn't see them. If, as long as we were out then, and they left it as it was, 
then they could use uh, our bathrooms. Imagine creating banquets and food and so on down here. Now, you've, only, you've done the little trip up to the dining room, which is very simple, just one, one floor. And so when the king came, King George the, uh, the Fifth and Queen Mary came on their tour of Lancashire and they stayed here in 1913 and we had a, a kind of a small intimate um, uh, uh, dinner for them upstairs, uh, um, um, only about 40 guests because they wanted something, you know, not too much. Um, we had a real problem on where to sit them upstairs because you'd have noticed there's a dais when I was standing behind me and that's normally where you would put the people for the top table if you like but it wasn't wide enough to have the table the king and queen and their footmen standing behind them as they should have been so we had to move it all around and we put them in the center of the room and it was fine so getting hot food from there up to the dining room that's easy enough but on big days on event days we would actually entertain all the people of the estate up in the long gallery where we are about to go and so that is a hundred steps, several floors, five complete turns of the spiral staircase up. And my mother was insistent that they should have hot food up there. And you've got to get it up there. And you have got a 25 pound goose, or you have a large apple pie. You have these massive cheeses. All of these things need to be got from here up there as fast as possible. And I never knew how it was done until when I was small, I decided to have a look and I was up in the long gallery and I had a look and I will now reveal the secret to you. So if you follow me back to the spiral staircase, I will tell you how it was done. So if I could ask you, sir, to go a short way up the stairs and stop, just round the corner, so, so I can just see you kind of poking your head round, it would be lovely. Excellent, you stop there. And if I could ask you, madam, if you go up and stand four steps below him. And if I could ask you to come and stand four steps below that. And then you would be here. And so the system was that we would get all the men from the estate and line them every fourth step. And so the dish would go from here to there, 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 to there and would be whizzed up the steps to the top floor like that. So as long as you have 25 spare men, there's not a problem. We're now going to go all the way up to the top. Um, as I say, take your time over it, and you're going to go up the easy way. Are you sure? Absolutely. In the, all right, I will go to the, to the front, and... Uh, so the long gallery. My siblings and I used to play in here a lot. And uh, because that, that was what it was originally intended for, of course, you know, on wet and, wet and windy days. You'd walk up and down so that you had some exercise. One of the reasons why we don't have as many bedrooms as you might expect in a house this size, because effectively this takes away five. So we had my sister Angela and then Nina, 14 years older than me and seven years older than me, then me, and then my brother Lawrence, who was a year below me, and we were inseparable. And then four years below me, uh, my brother Edward, and then last but not least was Catherine the, the youngest daughter. So for me, Gawthorpe was always the family house. It's where we had Christmases and so on. My brothers, even with Lawrence only being slightly younger, for them, home felt like Barbon, the lodge that I referred to up in Westmoreland, because for them, Christmases were moved there for their childhood. But for me, Gawthorpe was the center of my life. Christmas was fantastic. And my father, he had spent quite a lot of his childhood in Germany because his mother was quite delicate and they used to go onto the continent. And so he knew about Christmas trees before anyone else did. 
and he introduced the Christmas tree to the north of England. And he used to have the most amazing ones because we grew a lot of trees and woodland up at Barbon. And he would pick the best tree and bring it down and he would have it trimmed perfectly. And he would himself wire on all the candles, 400 candles, each with a little flat base and a little reflector by it so that it would go all the way down the main branches of the tree. And of course we had, because of the risk of fire, which you already know about, we had to have a footman on either side with a stick with a wet sponge <laughs> on it, just in case. Those are kind of our fire extinguishers, rather like that kind of living fire extinguishers, um, just in case. And we would have parties for the, uh, the local children and they would always have two presents because my mother said there's nothing, if you get really excited in anticipation and you've only got one present, it's not quite enough. So she would have two and they would be given an orange and an apple and things that they would never normally have. So kind of around the week either side of Christmas, we would have them all in. And the children would, would travel for, for miles and even if they were ill, they would always come, which was a bit of a, a, bit of a downside really. You know, they'd come and you'd suddenly have a, a, a measles epidemic afterwards because the child that shouldn't have come out at all used to come because it was Christmas. But if you can imagine on the event days when we would fill this with a hundred of the estate workers and we would have the long tables all the way down and all the food coming up, the route on the spiral staircase that you have just tested yourselves. And uh, there would be toasts to my father and uh, all the farmers and estate workers would be there. And we, all, we always had a special uh, event day bin of wine. Uh, my father never, never served them the best claret because he didn't want them to get a taste for it, he said. Uh, so we had event day wine in a particular bin that the butler looked after, uh, which they, they seemed to be happy enough with. That's excellent. So a place for fun, a place for entertainment, but also, let me think, what can I tell you about? Oh, James, the fireplace. It was being built, this hall, as you remember, from 1600 to 1605, and Queen Elizabeth died partway through that in 1603. Fortunately, we were able to deal with the fireplace to commemorate the appropriate monarch, part way through, so that we were able to have a reference there to James I. Now, James I, when he was coming down from Scotland, he didn't actually have very much money. He'd inherited the entire kingdom of England, but being Scots, he was actually quite skint. And he travelled down, he actually had to borrow money to travel down, and he stayed in all sorts of places on his way down. Now, fortunately, we were able to avoid that because the house wasn't finished enough, which was lucky. So he passed us by, but we were able to show that we had respect for the monarch of the day and be safe in that way. Always good. Because when monarchs and their um, and their people don't get on, you can have a bit of a problem, as we did with the English Civil War. Uh, and as I said, Colonel Richard, the first Shuttleworth really to live in this house, he was a parliamentarian. And he was in charge of the local uh, bit of parliamentary army, and he did, he did jolly well, actually, because Lord Derby was marching towards here with about 7,000 men. And when he got to read, my ancestor with 500 men managed to ambush him. And not only that, they ambushed him with such great effect that they actually started running away towards Warley. War had not always been so kind to the Shuttleworth family. I've mentioned my siblings, Lawrence and, uh, and Edward. Sadly, uh, Lawrence and Edward were both killed in the First World War. Uh, Lawrence was killed in action in 1917. He, uh, he was already married and had uh, three children, my uh, nieces and nephews I mentioned before. The three R's they were known as, Richard, again, uh, and uh, Rosemary and Ronald. And then my brother Edward 
was also killed in the First World War, very tragically. Uh, in this country, he was riding a, a motorcycle. He was stationed uh, in this country, and he was, his adjutant allowed him to go and see his newborn son. And he was riding his motorcycle back to the barracks, uh, when unfortunately, because it was 1917, the countryside was very different because all the people working on the land had gone to the trenches. And so everything was overgrown. The hedges were overgrown. And he was coming round a corner and didn't see, and he wasn't seen, that there was a, a hay cart stationary. And sadly, there was a, a tremendous accident, and, 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 and he died on his way back from seeing his son. So that was the, uh, the First World War, and uh, both my brothers, as I say, were, were, were sadly killed. So they each had themselves sons, and as the nature of our 20th century, they are a generation of soldiers apart between the First and Second World Wars. And so in the Second World War, my three nephews also fought. So Lawrence had two sons, the two R's, uh, Richard and Ronald, and my brother Edward had a son, Charles. And the World War, the Second World War, didn't do any more favours to us than the First World War had, in fact, because just after the war started, so in December 1939, my father died. Uh, he had lived for many years up at Barben, who was bedridden up there, and I had looked after Gawthorpe. So I split my life between the two. So when he died, the next uh, baron, which was uh, Richard asked me to look after the estates for him because he was on active service. He was a flying officer and sadly he disappeared somewhere over the channel in uh, 1940, the next year. So the title then passed to his brother, my nephew Ronald, uh, who was sadly killed in action in 1942. So we've had three uh, barons within such a short time, and then we ended up with the fourth, which was my nephew Charles. So each of the brothers and then cousin brothers had asked me to look after uh, the estates for them, uh, and it's one of the reasons why, as I said, I had never had an independent life until I was 60. Uh, and, but when Ronald died, it became really very difficult because Charles had disappeared. He was listed as wounded, in North Africa, but we had no idea where he was, and the army couldn't help us. And so everything had come to a halt, if you like. We had the estate managers still left to us, very kind of old and dodgy, but you know, just dealing with finances when suddenly you've had so many kind of transfers of the estate through in such a short period of time, and none of them actually available, and now we had a new one. Uh, my nephew Charles, who was wounded and we knew not where. So it made, made things very awkward. Um, we got round it by ways and means. Uh, but Charles eventually was able to come home and he'd been severely wounded. He had lost one leg and paralyzed in the other. Uh, but after the war, he married a lovely woman, lovely uh, Anne, and they moved back here to Gawthorpe. Uh, and they made various adaptations because obviously with a wheelchair, not the most wheelchair-friendly house, you might have noticed. Um, and so the entrance hall where we came in, that was, trans, uh, uh, that was turned into a kind of kitchen area for them so that he could uh, stay on that first entrance level. But in the end, it was realized that it was just too difficult for him to, to use this house. And so they bought another one from a relative of ours uh, up in Cumberland. So they, they bought Leck Hall, which was quite kind of just a, a, around the corner from Barben. And his mother lived in Barben. And uh, so they moved the access of the family, if you like, a bit further north. But I stayed here in Lancashire. Uh, initially, that was when I first moved out in, into Paddyham, a little house called Holly House. Uh, and uh, I was still very busy. And that's when I started my collection. And then my, car, my, my, my nephew Charles said, well, I'm no longer using the hall. You can use it. And that's when I started my craft house here. So my collection that I'd started with my obsessions from being a child of textiles, 
I was able to continue and used Gawthorpe as the basis for it. And so after I'd been to boarding school, I'd been to Paris and I'd studied art and I'd studied art history. I went to lectures at the, at the Louvre. I'd come home and I'd started talks myself and teaching. And as I said, those three things, mind and hand and eye. I wanted people to do things. It, I was very concerned. Here we are in the middle of the cotton industry, the center of, of, of mills, and people were losing their own crafts. Everything was being done by machine, not by their own hands. And so I'd started gathering my own collection of things just as, 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 as illustrations for my talks. Uh, and when I moved back into this house, I had about 2,000 things. People gave me things. Oh, you must be interested in this. And they'd write me a little note and they would send me things. And my vision was to have not an exhibition, not with glass between you and the things, but an active place where people could learn how to do things, could see what they could copy, could see what people had done over time and all over the world. As I said, we were great travelers. We'd got things from all over the place. I even followed some women in North Africa. I followed them into Perda once because I was just fascinated by the lace that they were wearing. And I followed after them and they eventually I man somehow managed to talk my way in to the, uh, into the Seraglio, if you like, behind Perda. But um, anyway, that's by the by. But it, it shows that I was obsessed by collecting whatever was interesting. And I would display it up here, just on, on hangers and on, uh, you know, on, on mannequins and flung over chairs and things so that people could come and, and see it and feel it and touch it and, and grasp how things were actually made. Sadly, one day I was up here with the vicar, we were having some tea, and I saw, horror of horrors, I saw a moth. <laughs> right, I said, vicar, we've got to deal with this, and so, poor man. We had to go up and down. It took us four hours to take everything that was up here all the way down the stairs, out onto the lawn, back up, get the next things down the stairs, out of four hours, up and down, exhausted, poor man. I kept going. And we took everything out on the lawn, give it a good shake, and then we had to fold it up with, with anti-moth things and, uh, and really have a big fight with the little creatures. And afterwards, I, I, you know, he, he did look a little bit tired. So uh, I, offered him, I offered him some tea, so I went and made him an omelette. Because I, I could cook easily for myself, but because being a girl guide, I'm, you know I was a, the commissioner for girl guides up in here in Lancashire, and uh, we used to have the most amazing camps every year. We'd have the tents lined up along the uh, alongside the house. I just love camp cooking. So rustling up an omelette or something like that, absolutely perfect. When I lived in Holly House, I didn't have a refrigerator, but I would have a, a kind of a net that I rigged up outside on, uh, on a, uh, below a tree. And that, that kept things nice and cool. Because c cold didn't worry me particularly. I was brought up without many fires. My mother had a fire and father, and uh, the lady's maid had one. Uh, and the guests had them, but we girls, we didn't have a fire. So it's really a question of getting out of bed and dressed as quickly as you could. Yeah, yeah Charlotte Bronte had, did have something to complain about, I will, will admit. Uh, drafty house, cold, uh, but lovely. Just look up, just look up. The ceilings everywhere are gorgeous. And I saw them from an early age. As I said, not enough bedrooms in this house. And so we girls, we just got shoved in anywhere. If we had guests staying, I could be put in with my mother's lady's maid or the guest's lady's maid or anywhere. I was used to sleeping wherever it was, but it meant that I got around all the rooms and it meant I could lie there at night staring at these ceilings, looking at patterns, finding shapes in them, finding ideas. I always liked looking upwards. I loved looking at the stars. When I was very little, I wanted to be an explorer. And Miss Matthews, Matty, she, uh, she, she used to teach me about the stars so that if I was ever in a desert or in the sea, I'd be able to navigate my way home. Let us move on down through to the next room. So this is the Huntroid room. And this is some of my work, the 
uh, hangings here, not the, the bedspread there, but the hangings around the edge and the one curtain there. And it's cruel work, C-R-E-W-E-L, which is a surface embroidery using wool. And it's based on a lot of Jacobean designs of nature and fruits and, uh, uh, and, and animals and so on. I, it only took me nine years to do the full set, uh, not only for the bed, but also for the, 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 um, the edge of the window as well. Uh, and uh, they think that the word cruel comes from the natural curl in the sheep's, the, the, the staple of the wool. Um, but that's what it is. And uh, I finished it in 1918. And I actually embroidered 11th November 1918 victory on it. Although, as I say, possibly not for our family. One of the rooms, again, where we look up and enjoy what we can see. I was, loved making things. Um, I was involved in uh, doing the most gorgeous golden uh, peacock that I designed and made for my parents' golden wedding anniversary. And involved in creating things for the Girl Guides as well. I was, in fact, awarded the Girl Guides silver fish, which is a high honour, I would have you know. Uh, for my work there. I was always busy. Girl guides, uh, during the Second World War, or be just before the Second World War, I spent all my time driving around inspecting places for the evacuation of the children of Lancashire. Uh, virtually single-handedly. In eight, eight, in eight months, I, travel, I drove 22,000 miles, which uh, on uh, pre-war roads wasn't, wasn't bad. But I had a theory of driving which scared my nephews and nieces, to be honest, uh, because my theory was if you're approaching a set of chickens, for example, you put the accelerator down as far as possible and drive at them as fast as possible, and then they'll scatter. And it seemed to work for me. As I say, my, my nephews started not coming with me anywhere, but there we go. And once I was driving around and my radiator blew a leak. You know what it's like when it's over heats and you're, you're spraying water everywhere. But I had heard that if you put a raw egg in the radiator, it would stop the leak. And I discovered as I put them, it was true. The only trouble was that I obviously didn't quite tighten the lid of the radiator back on quite well enough. And so Pardway drove on a few miles and it burst off. And suddenly it was like a kind of frothy meringue of white egg <laughs> spluttering all over the road, a trail and over the windscreen. I was trying to clean it off. And I, I got to where I was going, but I did look a little bit like a meringue. Um, but there we go. My father never quite got to grips with cars. I was the driver. I mean, after our first car, uh, and I said, it's done at most tremendous mileage because of all the things that we were doing. And I said, we need a new one. And he said, a new vehicle. I mean, the broom that uh, my father gave to your mother on our wedding is still going strong. Yes, I said, but, but father, you know, it, it's not doing the same mileage, really, as this car is. But after that, it was fine. So if ever I said to him, father, I need a new car, he would just say that's fine and uh, allow me just to go and buy one. So that was excellent because I was doing it everywhere. Uh, with all the jobs that I was doing. Anyway, let's have a look. One last stop, I think, on our way out on the staircase. Can I just uh, hop over there for me? What we have here is, in fact, the third staircase. So this is part of the 1850s changes. Originally, there was a, 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 a zigzag staircase uh, and then another uh, Jacobean one, and then this. But if you look out as well, you can see our parterre, and after that, the river. Now, the river used to run a little closer to the house originally, um, but obviously, after the Industrial Revolution, the river became pretty noxious, pretty polluted, uh, rather unpleasant, with all the dyes and waste stuffs from the cotton industry and so on being thrown into it, uh, further upstream. And in 1860, there was what was called the Cotton Famine, which caused an awful lot of distress in this area. There'd been all sorts of problems of overproduction of woven cotton in the early 1860s, and then we had 
uh, speculation in the cotton market for raw cotton. We had the American Civil War and blockades. Sorry, American War of Independence, blockades. So we've ended up with an absolute slump in the cotton industry and a lot of mill workers were just thrown out of jobs. So my grandfather, one of the things that he did was a various make work schemes. And so his two make work schemes was one was moving the river because why wouldn't you? So you dig a new channel and move what you don't want a little bit further away. Excellent. And also creating the terraces and parterre. They were in Barry's original design, but they'd never got around to doing them in the 1850s. And so again, he employed so many of the local mill workers so that they had employment, so that they had income when their own industry had disappeared entirely. Um, they had a little bit of work getting used to it because, of course, their, their fingers were not quite used to uh, shoveling and digging, um, having been working in the, in, in the textile mills. Chandelier here, rather good. Uh, again, it was oil-fired, uh, oil if I can put it that way. Always takes two footmen to, uh, to light it and fill it because you need one at the top because through there is a winch to wind it down to the bottom so that, that then it can be filled and lit and then signaled and it winds back up again so that we have our lit chandelier for the staircase. As we go down the stairs, you'll be able to see portraits of my parents, um, Utrid and, uh, and, and Blanche on the staircase. And then there are the exhibition rooms that there are now of uh, the family, and of my life and collection. So if I may say thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate. The house is now open for you to go wherever you wish, revisit rooms where you've been. I'm afraid the kitchen won't any longer be open uh, because you have been treated specially in that way. Um, but please thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy Gawthorpe Hall as much as I have.